Welcome and good evening. I'm so glad you're here with us tonight. I'm Alicia Phillip, President of the Community Foundation, and I think I know almost everyone in the room. The Community Foundation, as most of you know, is a collection of donors that power good in the community. And we're working hard to build and grow and to become an even more powerful resource for our donors and for the community. Pure philanthropic dollars, though, are not enough to totally make the ad a difference and to address all the challenges that this community faces. It's going to take a multi-pronged approach. It's going to take collaborations and new ways of thinking about how we can move money in a way that really can power this community forward further and faster. And your work through the Community Foundation can make a more powerful impact in our community. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that at the end. But to set the tone for why we're here, I want to put you all in a place where you're thinking about how you interact with the Community Foundation. We like to say that we serve as your GPS. Some of our donors know exactly where they're going, and so that being that GPS is fairly easy, and our role is just to help them get there effectively and efficiently. For others, they know the goal is to give back, but maybe they need some insight into the path that they should follow. So how can they focus? How can they be strategic in their philanthropy? How can they really get to those issues that are core to them and really can make a difference? And what's the best organizations in those areas to, to, to do the work that they want done? So let me show you a short video of, that outlines the journey of a typical donor so you can see what I mean. From the beginning, you were driven driven to do what's right for yourself, your family, and your community. And now, there are so many ways to give. How do you know which direction is the right one? You start with the Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta. Since 1951, the Community Foundation has been providing individuals and families with trusted, expert philanthropic services connecting donors to the knowledge, issues, and causes that strengthen the greater Atlanta region and the world beyond. Here's how it works. You make a gift of cash, stock, or other assets. You get an immediate tax benefit and a fund is created that's an investment for philanthropy. The foundation serves as a GPS, helping you navigate your personal philanthropic journey and connecting you with ways to impact the causes you're most passionate about. Your gift can be used to benefit nonprofits in Atlanta, nationally and internationally. The fund is invested wisely and strategically for maximum impact. We can even work with your current trusted advisor to invest the fund. You can choose to give now or later. It's a lifelong journey that can include your entire family and create a legacy of giving that lasts for generations. Your fund can reap ongoing financial benefits, allowing you to continue your philanthropic journey no matter where it takes you. So talk with the Community Foundation today. After all, philanthropy isn't just something you do, it's somewhere you go. Let's get started. So I hope for those of you who are not totally familiar with how the Community Foundation operates, that that gives you sort of an updated picture of how we can be with you on that journey of philanthropy, helping you to navigate the path, whether you know exactly where you're going or not. You're in for a real treat tonight with Ginny and Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a new friend to me, but I've known Ginny longer than either she or I cared to talk about. Ginny's both a professional colleague and a personal friend, and the Community Foundation has a deep relationship with the organization that Ginny leads, the National Center on Family Philanthropy. And I can truly say that our organizations have grown up together. The Community Foundation was there at the beginning of the National Center on Family Philanthropy, and I've had the pleasure of serving on the board. Each time that Ginny visits with us, she brings new and deeper knowledge about what's happening with family philanthropy. What are the latest trends? What are things that families are thinking about differently now? And I think you'll get some insights tonight that'll help you on your journey. Tonight is all about family philanthropy and how one family approached the transition between generations and in that process transformed their own giving and the way they approach it. I know a lot of our donor families have gone through that. 
Some are at the beginning of the journey, some are in the middle, some have gone through it, want to go back and start over again. So I know that you'll take away a nugget or two that is relevant to where you are. And I want you also to know that as part of the Community Foundation, you can access all the services of the National Center on Family Philanthropy. You only need to talk to your philanthropic advisor to talk to Stacy or Barrett or Aaron or Kathleen, whoever is your advisor, and they can help you access so much of the information and resources and research that is available through the National Center on Family Philanthropy. Now I'd like to turn it over to Mendel Balknight so that he can introduce our two speakers. Good evening and thank you. I'm Mendel Balk Knight. I'm the Vice President of Philanthropy for the Community Foundation. And it's great to see so many familiar faces from various relationships that I've enjoyed in my 37 years here in Atlanta from different places. We're glad to have you with us. And the new faces, some of you for the first time with the Community Foundation, some of you here learning about the Community Foundation, we're glad to have you with us tonight because tonight is going to be a very special conversation that I think you will really, as Alicia said, take away much from. As she said, tonight's the further evidence of the opportunities that you have with the Community Foundation to inform, engage, and open your eyes to philanthropy and, and the impact you can have and your family can have and the differences that you're making in shaping the future of your community. Uh, and we're trying to connect the dots. Last year, some of you were with us when Coventry Edward Pitts, author of the book Raised Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise, joined us. Coventry is one of the people quoted in the book you'll be getting tonight as you leave, where she talks about that book that you are going to enjoy. She says the authors have provided a fascinating roadmap on how others might leverage their resources to change the world. Last November at the Southeastern Council on Foundations, Barrett Coker Christ, our senior philanthropic officer, and I had the opportunity to participate with our two guests that you're going to hear tonight in a similar conversation. And it was after that session, as many of you know, I've, I've been around Atlanta for 35 years. It was my first three months with the Community Foundation. I shared with Elizabeth how her story put a real-life example to all that I had been reading and hearing and trying to absorb about community foundation and generational transfer and, and all the conversations that we're engaged in day in and day out and how they were redefining philanthropy and what they're doing. It's our privilege to welcome Jenny Esposito, president of the National Center for Family Philanthropy, and Elizabeth Phillips. Since 2013, Elizabeth has served as the executive director of the Phillips Foundation and her leadership and vision has a statement in their website I went to. And in their own words, they describe themselves as being positioning the Phillips Foundation as a private family foundation and a catalytic capital platform which leverages its resources for positive change through impact investing, strategic grants, and original programs. We are committed 100% to impact. That's the kind of thinking foundations like the Phillips Foundation are bringing to philanthropy today. With that, welcome Jenny and Elizabeth. Thank you, Mendel. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you for inviting um, me and Elizabeth to be with you this evening. It's a very special night. Um, I, when I was asked to come and, and, and spend some time with Elizabeth, I thought about our, a trend study that the National Center did in 2015, and the number one concern on the minds of giving families was the next generation. Far and away, it was the, um, the, the thing they had the most questions about. But the second thing, and this may surprise some of us who's been in, who have been in this work for a long time, their second concern was the impact that they're having, the effectiveness of their giving. So we want to bring both of those together. Um, I've been asked to do a little overview of the issue, but I've asked Elizabeth to keep me, you know, 
anchored. <laughs> Tell me when, ah, oh, she looks like this, I'm not doing, and, you know, and to echo if what I'm saying makes sense. And then we're going to switch to really engaging her in a conversation about some of the issues that she's gone through, because they're pretty spectacular. The first thing that I have to tell you is that, uh, is the sort of the bad news. There's no monolithic or homogeneous description of what next generation means. It means something different to most families. What's important is to re realize what are your goals for the next generation. I was with a family one time and they were very concerned about the next generation and they put months into developing the most specific process for choosing next gens to be trustees of their foundation. When I asked them what they had hoped to accomplish with this, they said they wanted their children to grow up to be charitable. And I wondered, isn't there a disconnect? If you want your children to be charitable, you can have a terrific and sophisticated um, selection for donor advisors or for trustees, but don't you want to get them involved in giving, even from a very young age? And I know you've got some great thoughts about that. Um, the second thing that I want to point out to you with one of my favorite stories, I'm, I like to tell stories, is that it's also important to know that some of us are learning this as we go along. And those of us who have been doing it for a very long time, as Alicia alluded to, are also still learning. And the reason is, we haven't been having this conversation for very long in philanthropy. So many people grew up thinking of the giving as something they inherited after their parents passed away. And the notion that we care about how young people think about their own volunteer, their own giving trail, um, that's really very, very, very new. And one of my favorite stories, and I tell this, it's a little bit bittersweet because it's a story about Abby O'Neill. And Abby was the eldest of the Rockefeller Cousins generation. If you know anything about that, they talk about JDR and they talk about the brothers. There was actually a woman in the brothers, by the way. <laughs> and that was Abby's mother. And so she was the eldest of the, um, the children. And, and Abby just passed away. So it, it, like I say, it's a little bittersweet. But she was trying to tell me what it was like to be an adult and trying to fight your way into the family giving. And she, she talked about the fact that one time she was at a reception with her uncle Lawrence, and Abby was about to be the first next generation chair of one of the family's philanthropies. And she was so excited. And she was just talking to Lawrence like, isn't this the best thing? And she noticed that Lawrence kept backing up and she'd move a little closer. <laughs> and Lawrence kept backing up and she'd move a little closer. And finally Lawrence was against the wall and she said, Uncle Lawrence, I suspect you're not exactly comfortable with this conversation. And he said, you know, you just need to wait your turn. You, you need to wait your turn. And Abby said, Uncle Lawrence, I qualified for Social Security last month. Exactly when is my turn? <laughs> okay. So the good news is we've learned a lot that it is not a great idea to keep your kids at bay, no matter what kind of giving you do, no matter what kind of um, philanthropy you engage in. Um, Elizabeth's going to be a wonderful example for that. But I'm particularly intrigued for those that want to make sure their children understand their charitable values and their philanthropic um, intentions, that they don't bring them in earlier when they can be at the table with them and talking about these things. It would be so terrific. Now, I also want to be clear that some of you may be thinking very different communities when you think about next gen. For some people, it, you may have been doing this kind of giving involved with the Community Foundation for a couple of generations. You may be thinking about the third generation. Maybe they don't all live in Atlanta. You're a little worried about your commitment to this community. Maybe you're seeing that geographic dispersion is the only way they're different. They've got different, they have their own ideas about what they want to give to. Can, can you imagine? Um, so some of us are thinking about that. Some of us are 
well, I can't say this with a straight face because I was about to say young. Um, but some of you are younger donors and your kids may be very young, much like you, uh, you know, Elizabeth. And um, you're thinking about just getting them to the point where they think about being charitable. And uh, one of the things that I get asked all the time is when I, you should teach your children about charitable giving. And I say the first time the child says the word, mine. <laughs> I hear that a lot. You do you? Around it's, our house, yeah. You hear it, it's mine, it's mine. And your two boys are about to have to deal with a sister, can you imagine? But, but what's the first concept you end up teaching your children? It's, it's about sharing. It's about thinking of these things, not as yours so much, but as gifts exactly. and things like mm -hmm. that. When Alicia was talking about the tragedies we faced, I remembered the story of Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And Mr. Rogers says he remembered when he was young hearing about something terrible that had happened. And he was feeling, as children do, very helpless in the face of the tragedy. And when his mother realized that he was distressed by this, she told him to look for the helpers. Where you find the helpers, you'll find people trying to make it better. And he said it was his first introduction to looking for people, to, for those people who were trying to make it better. I just love Mr. Rogers. Um, for those of you, so for others, it's because you're young. For some of you, it's you're just beginning the process. Maybe you've just, the, the money has just been made. Maybe you're the first in your family to get involved. And for some of you, you may be looking at all the ways that you can, um, think about your giving and think about the different um, vehicles available to you. And for that, there is no better GPS than the Community Foundation here in Atlanta. Um, I may be Alicia's friend, but I know a great thing when I see it. And I see hundreds of community foundations, many of them trying, especially in the last couple of years, Alicia, a lot of them are trying to set up services for donor families. Alicia and I were talking about this in the late 1980s. And in the 90s, when the center was being set up, so was the center at Atlanta. So that, that's just terrific. So let's now um, talk a little bit about what I just have, tell people when they ask me, how do I know if things are going well? What do I do to have things go well? And, um, it, as a segue, since the next thing are going to be direct questions for you, Elizabeth, whether or not these make sense to you, too. So the first thing I always say is, welcome a new generation with a full heart, but be prepared for a handful. <laughs> it's, it's not going to be that. And you have such a great story about you were welcomed at a very young age. No, no social security, you. Um, be as clear about roles and expectations as you can. Uh, my experience, young adults don't want to be a rubber stamp um, to whatever it is you're doing, although there are an awful lot of people I meet who are donors who say they want their children to get to know what they're doing before they, um, before they take you know, on causes of their own or, or want to have a say in the family's giving. And I say, that's fine as long as you don't cross a line. Um, the line is if you say to your family, all those in favor of my wonderful proposal say I, all opposed say I resign. Okay, <laughs> that's what we call the entrepreneurial donor. Um, think about eligibility. Kids want to know that they're at a table. And young adults certainly want to know that they're at a table because of what they bring, not just because they're in the lucky gene club. You know, they want you to tell them, this is why you're looking forward to working with them. This is what you hope they'll learn. This is what you hope they'll teach you. Um, think about promoting their own interests and their own causes. I'm going to say this with, my, um, with a, a big caveat coming, but I don't say the first sentence with any caveat at all. Children have passions of their own. They have things that they care about. And you can get them interested by helping them see that they can do something in an issue that they care about. You can help them start volunteering. Um, 
uh, someone I was speaking to recently, her daughter was trying to, to get better at reading. She loved animals. Guess who's doing reading at the shelter these days to the animals? She can practice. The animals don't complain <laughs> if she's having a little bit. I, I, I'm always horrified by this thought because when my niece was first learning to read, we let her read the bedtime story. And at the end of it, she was so proud. And her younger brother said, Erin, you don't do that very well. And I was like, eh, no. The animals won't complain. She found a way to link her daughter's interests to something where she could make a difference. Um, think about, at the same time you encourage their interests, think about shared values and mission. If you're inviting them to be part of a family endeavor, there should be something shared about that endeavor. Now, some of you will come up with vehicles that may allow them to do giving on their own. I'm talking about when you're all coming together. Now, strangely enough, not all family members agree about the things they care about. Um, there's a reason I'm an individual donor. Um, but you can say, all right, there may be some things that are off the table, but where's the shared space? Where are the things we can do together that can really help us as a family learn something and advance something we care about? And on, you know, on, on the sides, we're going to keep doing the kinds of things that make a difference to us personally. Um, many of you will be in a position to set up donor advised funds for your younger children. Uh, and that's a wonderful way to get them into a community where they can learn a lot. On this other hand, try not to teach them that philanthropy is something you do with someone else's money. So what are they investing in terms of time? Volunteering according to their own means. Many next generation kids don't have the same level of wealth of previous generations. But what can they do? whether it's the responsibility of doing the work of the advice fund or the foundation, whether it's volunteering, whether it's giving according to their own means. Balance those things. Give them the opportunity to give. That's a fabulous education. But also don't let them think that lets them off the hook quite so completely. Um, one of the things that's new, and I do absolutely encourage those of you who have children in the late teens, early 20s, teach them what it means to be asked to serve on a nonprofit board. Many young people are so honored by the invitation, they may not know what the expectations are, whether it's responsibilities or giving or whatever. So it's something you may not have prepared to hear tonight, but it's something I help a lot of families with after the fact. I helped a family in Texas recently. The young person was put on the board. He, of course, said yes. Um, he, although the foundation is a billion dollars, he's not personally wealthy. And he did not know that the nonprofit's expectation was that he would give $500,000 a year to the, it was the opera board but I hate to say that in the middle of the art center. <laughs> um, but wow, both, it was both disheartening for him to realize that's, pro that's why he was asked, he thought, but also he did try to pressure his family for a while to make that gift. So help them understand what being in a community of caring family members means. Um, when I said that there were young people who didn't have to come into this because they were already leaders, they're already giving, there is no more remarkable example of that person than Elizabeth Phillips. Um, she's already playing a hugely important part in our field, a role in our field. Um, Elizabeth is from Dallas, although I learned today she was a young person in Atlanta. Right here on Haversham uh, Road. You're right on Haversham Road, there you go. Um, I'm not from Atlanta, but so she's my credential. <laughs> credential. I like to come here. Um, like any good Dallas citizen, she graduated from SMU and is quite an entrepreneur. You'll hear about that. She founded her own jewelry business while she was still in high school. 
and has been the founding designer of the Akola Project, a nonprofit social business that empowers marginalized women in Uganda and Dallas. Since 2013, she served as executive director of the Phillips Foundation and has led their work providing high impact grants in Greensboro and Guilford County, North Carolina. She's a leader in the nonprofit and business communities and a national leader on the issue of impact investing. Her stories are the best, so I won't keep you from them anymore. Please help me welcome Elizabeth. Oh, thank you. Um, we're going to get to the Phillips Foundation in a little bit, but the first thing I want to talk about is somebody who in high school starts a business and someone who has a sense of the social implications of some of that work so that it wasn't just Dallas, it went on to be Uganda. Tell me a little bit about how that started for you. Yeah, happy to go way back to that. First, just wanna say thank you so much for having me. It's great to be back in Atlanta. I lived here during my middle school years um, and went to Pace Academy. Then my mom founded Heritage Preparatory School of Georgia where I was the first graduate. Um, <laughs> and then we moved back to Dallas where I went to high school. So mm -hmm. to answer your question, high school, I had always had this inclination towards fashion and making things. My grandmother on my dad's side had a jewelry store in Blaville, Arkansas, and I would always go rummage through the broken um, pieces or her extra inventory and create something out of old vintage jewelry. And so it just was something I always was interested in doing. And my parents are both entrepreneurial, so it was only natural that I thought, oh, I can make a business of this. It started off as just selling jewelry to friends at school who complimented my necklace. Um, but because my family had ingrained in me uh, a charitable side, I um, ended up unknowingly at the time, because there wasn't really a term for it, creating one of the first social businesses in Dallas. So my jewelry company was a for-profit business, but I had nonprofit collections within that, where I'd work with women in the community, um, either coming out of homelessness or would design collections that would benefit a nonprofit. Um, so at 21, it, uh, in the middle of graduating from SMU and um, dating my boyfriend, now husband, seriously. Um, there's an article that came out that I still giggle about. It was the front page of the Dallas Morning News business section, and the title was A World of Good, Social Entrepreneurship on the Rise. And it was a picture of me holding my mom's dog, not even my dog, and a necklace. And it's just so funny looking back now because there's so many social businesses and the emergence of even B Corps and a whole social entrepreneurship movement and that's not really what I was trying, a trend I was trying to latch onto or anything. It was just following my passions and having parents who facilitated that in me um, that led to that. And my dad who's been a CEO his whole career was like, how did you get on the front page of the Dallas Morning News <laughs> business section before? I um, and so anyways, that, um, that coverage and that, um, that opportunity to create something at a young age did end up leading me to Uganda um, after meeting through SMU Connections, an Atlanta girl, Brittany Merrill, who had started an orphanage over there. And um, she knew what I had been doing in jewelry. I knew through our sorority at SMU that she had started this orphanage. Um, but she had realized through that process that she really um, wanted to empower the women of Uganda so that they could care for the orphans instead of creating an orphanage that fed a system that sustainably didn't really uh, seemed to help um, sustainably. So I went over to Uganda and was founding designer of Akola, where I um, trained the first 12 women in jewelry design. There's now 400 women in Uganda working for the project, and um, there have been 100 women in Dallas who have served Akola, been given jobs by Akola, and it's now sold in all 42 Neiman Marcus department stores and um, several hundred boutiques around the country. So that was my background before marrying into the Phillips family. I'd helped start and scale six nonprofits before the age of 23. Um, and I was running my jewelry business. And um, then things sort of changed. They sure did. They sure did. Now talk about a family that didn't keep their young people at bay. Tell me a little about, and, and our, the group around your wonderful experience of, I guess, getting a phone call one day. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, my husband and I had been dating since we were freshmen at SMU. Um, we got married right out of college and about six months into being newlyweds, um, we'd found out we had a baby on the way, our first. Um, this is my third. I have two boys that are five and two and a half. Thank God this one's a girl. Um, <laughs> you say that now, wait till she's 13. I know, I know. Well, um, 
but anyways, we were newlyweds, baby on the way. Um, I just bought a home. I was running my jewelry company that I built for seven years. My husband was a financial analyst for Goldman Sachs. Um, then we get a call from his great uncle, and he told Kevin, you need to move home or there won't be a family business to run. So what happened is Kevin's grandfather had passed away um, pretty suddenly um, after a kidney transplant that was expected to go well. And there was a generational gap in the leadership of the full family enterprise platform. So overnight, we hightailed it out to Greensboro, North Carolina from Dallas, Texas. Um, I was 23, he was, my husband was 24. Um, we inherited over 150 employees in the third generation operating business. And upon the settlement of the estate, we became the largest um, Guilford County focused family foundation. So we, it's not like um, in a lot of families, maybe there's a conversation that happens of, you're going to be up to bat. Let's talk about kind of <laughs> what nope. this real estate company is, what the family foundation is. None of that. It was more so thrust upon us and landed in our laps. But it's been an amazing opportunity that we've tried to steward well. Um, and so that's kind of how we landed in our role with um, the company and the foundation as and, well. And Kevin is, most, for the most part, running the company, and you are running the foundation. And this happened exactly. at 23 and 24. Exactly. So my husband had his hands full settling the estate um, and trying to wrap his arms around the family company, which is multifamily real estate across the Southeast apartments. Um, and fortunately, um, he had worked alongside his grandfather as an intern, you know, even laying carpet in apartments in high school, and he knew about the industry. He'd also worked for my dad, um, whose career's been in real estate um, throughout college. Uh, that's a way to vet a daughter's boyfriend, make them work for you. While <laughs> dating. Um, and so he, he was able to get quickly up to speed, and he's a smart cookie, but, um, so he had his hands full, and the family, um, was scattered. So we were the only ones in Greensboro, ironically. We moved to Greensboro to run a family office platform and we're the only family, the Phillips family there. So Kevin's uncle, the other stakeholders were Kevin's uncle who's in Miami, Florida, his father who was in Asheville, North Carolina, and his sister who's younger and um, lives in Los Angeles. So um, we just had to figure it out. So. Um, it is in the trust documents for the foundation, it's a charitable trust entity, that no spouses of family members could participate as board members at the same time as the family member was on the board. Um, because I mean, Kevin's grandfather loved me, but he didn't like some of the other people's wives. <laughs> we can see that. <laughs> that never happens, so, by the way. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure you could write a book on this. So um, anyways, it was in the trust documents. So I couldn't serve as a trustee on the foundation board, but the loophole was I could run the foundation. So <laughs> the family hired me as ED with a very <laughs> small level symbolic salary, which I insisted upon because I wanted it to be formalized. Um, that, that was my job. I took it seriously and it was a responsibility I wanted to steward to the utmost of my ability and also to justify the time I would be taken away as a new mother from my child. Um, so I took it on as, you know, my new career and path and liquidated my jewelry company, um, remained involved in a lot of boards. I started sitting on nonprofit boards when I was 16 years old. Um, and so I knew a lot about asking for money, but it was interesting to be on the flip side of that conversation, um, giving money away. And it's really neat, kind of a full circle moment for me to actually be in, um, in this context at a community foundation gathering, because it was the community foundation um, in Greensboro that was the one that got me up to speed and really partnered with us as that GPS. Um, that was a very real experience that I've lived through and continue to, um, to enjoy and partnering with the Community Foundation of Greensboro. That's, that's a terrific um, sort of, you know, sort of analysis with what's going on here, which is that there are some people here who are very new um, to this or thinking about where they're going to go next. And we hadn't thought about this before, but the Community Foundation was important to you. How does a person who doesn't know Greensboro and has never run a foundation, what did you do to give yourself a community, a learning mm -hmm. opportunity? What were some of the things that you made available to yourself? Yeah, so we had the advantage of being new to the community, the advantage and disadvantage, but uh, we see it in hindsight 
really is an advantage because we had fresh eyes. Mm -hmm. We didn't understand the politics, which is pros and cons there. Um, but we came in not as the Phillips family saying, this is how we've done it for three generations uh -huh. and this is our focus. But we really got to work through the exercise of not what do we care about as the Phillips family, but what does the community need? So that's the approach we took. And I really went on a listening tour um, before I got labeled as a philanthropist and before people knew um, about the Phillips Foundation. Right. And intended, I intentionally did not brand the foundation in the beginning so that I could get real answers from people. So I went and met through the Community Foundation's guidance with different nonprofit EDs to learn what were their needs. In the back of my mind, they didn't know this when I was asking questions, but um, I really guided the family towards thinking about not doing philanthropy as usual. The Charitable Trust historically had um, $50 grants on its books. And I thought, well, I, I don't have time for that. Like, we've got to give away $3 million a year. I, I want to grants. target large amount, high impact grants that move the dial or solve something um, in Guilford County. So those were my two qualifications to the family in accepting the job, is that we would take a place-based approach. Really, that was out of convenience because I was having a baby and <laughs> I knew I couldn't take on anything national or global issue-wise. Um, so I said, let's take a deep dive into Guilford County and let's pinpoint those once in a generation game changer grant opportunities. So in listening to the community, um, we found out that there were some issues that a million dollars could solve by implementing, you know, bringing some national best practices to the community that were already being thought about. Um, and so we took an issue agnostic approach there. Um, instead of coming in and saying, we care about arts, education, and animals or whatever, um, we ended up granting over the four years that we lived there. We now live back in Dallas, by the way, um, and commute to North Carolina monthly. But we felt like while we lived there, we really needed to take a deep dive in the community. And so we pinpointed about a dozen grants, game changer grants, excuse me. Um, and it was everything from ending chronic homelessness in three years. We did that with $2 million and the right partners. Um, and that meeting happened because the Community Foundation of Greensboro said, you need to um, meet Daryl, this dynamic executive director, who initially, again, not knowing um, what the Phillips Foundation was or who we were, Kevin's grandfather was also sneaky rich, so no one really targeted us um, until you know things unfolded. But um, he asked me for a $75,000 grant to pay for a tracking system that was federally mandated for the homeless population coming through the continuum of care in Guilford County. So this was, looking back, is so humbling that I got to and get to ask this question. And I said, Daryl, I'm not declining that your need is $75,000. That's your immediate need for this chin system. But what would you do with a million dollars? And you know, you I'm 23 years old out of college. Right. He's like, well, why are you even asking me that? I know, I know. you don't. When you picked Daryl up off the floor, what did he say? <laughs> um, and he kind of got teary, and he goes, "We could end chronic homelessness." I was like, "Okay, that's a totally different conversation. Tell me how we could do that." Well, there's this national best practice, um, the Housing First model, that's proven, you know, in different communities around the country. Um, okay, model that out for me. How much time would that take? How many dollars would that take? Um, and we initially launched the Housing First initiative in Greensboro. Um, it was like a $1.8 million grant and then ended up doing a second round of funding to it. Um, but in three years, we were able to take the chronic homeless population in Guilford County, countywide, um, from 142 to the last count I got in a month ago is three. So we're one of two communities in the country that can claim we've reached almost sustainable zero in chronic homelessness. That's terrific. So that's, that's an terrific. example I bring up um, because it was one of the first um, grants that put, put us at, at a podium in Guilford County. And um, we were able to brand the Phillips Foundation as this is the kind of work we want to do. And so then it became easier to filter out the opportunities that we funded. You know, one of the things I haven't thought about asking you before, but... This is how we always do it. It's I know, like we always end up going this way. Forget the paper. Sorry, Sorry about the script. <laughs> For those of you who, were so, who looked at our script. Um, you have a very dispersed family, and now you yourself 
are back in Dallas. How did you, I, and I understand that a lot of the motivation was you had a very young, young family, but how did you get buy-in to maintain commitment to Guilford County from a family that could have wanted you to give in Los Angeles or Miami or wherever? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I get asked a lot. Um, and the answer is honestly, they were relieved because I think some fa there are a lot of different ways to approach that issue with families that are dispersed and multi-generational. Um, but you know, early on in the conversations before I became involved, it was, okay, Keith, you get your bucket, Kevin, you get your bucket, Katie, you get your bucket. And they didn't want, they had their own focuses. Right. And this kind of just happened really quickly. And they didn't want to have to present to the family different grants they wanted to give to. Everyone's already philanthropic on their own too, but this um, foundation, we knew that there was power in numbers. And so that if we didn't break up the foundation into buckets, that we could um, align our assets towards common goals. Mm -hmm. um, and it made sense to the family because the company that still had quartered in Greensboro was founded 50 years ago. It was the Patriarch's hometown. Um, it's where we'll always have a presence because of the company headquarters and, um, and of course, the foundation as well now. Um, and it gave people that quarterly opportunity to come together. And we actually like each other. So it's a, it's a very small family. Although we're dispersed, mm -hmm. it's a very small family. Yeah. So it's a good thing we don't mind each other's presence. Um, but everyone was kind of energized about mm -hmm. this has focus. And um, it's not something I'm going to have to put a lot of time into. But at the same time, I can trust that it's being stewarded well and I get to participate in the journey. You talk about the fact that you're not a big family, but there's definitely a next generation, mm -hmm. um, some present, some about to be. Um, tell me a little bit, because I think you, you have a really interesting way of looking at your children and what they care about and getting them involved in the values, if not some of the idea of community involvement and giving. Yep. Tell us a little bit about how you're doing that with one so young. Yeah, so it's funny, when we were on the phone talking about this panel, we've done this presentation together before, but um, she said, you know, they really want us to talk about multi-generational engagement and family philanthropy, but I know your kids are so young, I'll just talk about kind of some trends I'm seeing. I was like, actually, we are working on this right now at Phillips Philanthropy. So the, um, the Phillips Foundation, since under an umbrella entity we, my husband and I created called Phillips Philanthropies, which involves several donor advised funds for various family members and the endowment of Kevin's grandfather at Phillips Foundation, of course. Um, but within Phillips Philanthropies, we felt like there should be an entity we created for our family that does engage our children, young as they are, in the conversation because philanthropy is going to be a part of their future. We were kind of blindsided by our role in the Family Foundation and philanthropy practice. Um, but we thought, OK, we can't start this young enough with our kids, maybe overcompensating for <laughs> what we went through. But our, our oldest, who's now five, he started making grants when he was three years old. What we did was we created a Give As We Grow fund um, just for our family, where um, my son would take a little lollipop, for example, to his little preschool. Um, and it would say, here's a gift from the Give As We Grow Fund. And they're micro grants, because I agree with Jenny. Um, you don't want your kids too, getting too used to giving other people's money away. Um, so these are like 50 to $500. Our foundation only grants between $500,000 and $5 million. They're going to be at the kiddie table a while before they're in those conversations. But they can learn about giving 10 50 500 away over the course of their youth. Um, and so we, made it, we downsized it to kitty lingo, um, and then we thought, okay, this needs to be bigger than just our family, as I engaged in conversation with other philanthropic families, and then also just have the desire to democratize philanthropy beyond high net worth families and individuals to anyone, because giving is a gift that we should all be able um, to share, and there are a lot of generous families who aren't financially mm -hmm. wealthy, but give in other ways. So. Um, Actually, I'm really excited, y'all, because you're the first ones to see this. Yes. I did not plan on presenting on Give As We Grow, but um, because of the nature of this topic, specifically what they asked us to speak about, um, we'll unveil it here. And because when I heard about it, I was like, oh my gosh, yes. this is fun. <laughs> 
So, so we're creating a, a digital platform where children can track their giving throughout their youth from starting as early as zero to three. Oh, there we are. There we are. <laughs> right, that's not our children. There we go. Um, so it was really one of my web designers for another startup I'm working on um, outside of the philanthropy practice who, when I kind of mentioned this, she took the idea and ran with it. And she was like, oh, we can make games that are Candyland themed that t teach about giving and give where you go, give as you grow. So my kids, they like to go to the Children's Museum in Greensboro, the Science Center. Um, so we talk about, you know, these places only operate because people donate to them. Mm -hmm. And a three-year-old can get that. So of course, he's like, well, I want to bring all my money in my piggy bank so that other children can enjoy the summer camp I just went to at the Children's Museum. Um, this is kind of what the platform will look like, where um, it'll be live in 2018. You can see kind of the, I didn't realize I clicked that. Did I pass the, oops. Yeah, so you'll get a dashboard of your giving over time. So by the time you're 18, if you've tracked through the Give As We Grow platform, you can start to see in your own childhood themes that emerged. Like you um, enjoyed going to the animal shelter. That's right. And you're going to forget that at 25, that maybe you went to read, at animals, read to animals when you were four, five, six. So this tracks this over time. And you can see um, in this family, you know, there's three kids and what they all individually like to give to. And then hopefully it will facilitate a conversation within families, um, parent to child, or it could be um, approached by teacher to class or something in that regard too, um, where there's a conversation being had, but also some data tracking. So when that kid does graduate from the kitty table to a foundation board or a nonprofit board, they've been educated and as much as they can be and prepared um, through this. So these are just some hypotheticals. Did I already click to this one? Yeah, so um, even as young as zero to three, there can be video content and then more early childhood stuff, adolescence, and then the teen years. So um, tossing around with my COO of Phillips Philanthropies, we're thinking how cool would it be if an 18-year-old wrote their college essay, admissions essay about their Give As We Grow um, mm -hmm. platform or uh, got a diploma at 18 where you graduate from Give As We Grow. Um, so we are having this conversation, not only as a family, but I think it's um, something hopefully that our millennial generation can offer to the next mm -hmm. so that those problems you mentioned, kind of right. the late conversation that's happening now, we can um, inspire giving help, yeah. in what we consider the next generation, our kids, yet to be born in this case. We, um can sometimes not realize just how much children have been, have, have been impacted by organizations they've touched and whose life, who has, have touched their lives. I remember, um, and by the way, I'm a great proponent of ants being involved in this kind of work and supporting the parents. I am the professional aunt of 14, so <laughs> I do this, and 50% of my giving goes to support their giving. But when they were little, none of them could understand what I did for a living. So I finally at Thanksgiving gave a seven, a nine, and a 12-year-old a fund. And I said, just to start them out, I'm going to give you $150. If you all can agree on where it's going to go, if you can't, we can split it. And if you really can't, we can divide it in thirds. And listening to the seven-year-old talk about a visit to the Cousteau Society and how he all of a sudden was terribly concerned about oceans and all of these kinds of things, it was a real awakening for me. But the best part came a couple of weeks later. Apparently, they were having a meeting, and they called me up, and they said, Anthony, um, we're having our meeting, and we don't agree. So we're trying to give, but we're stuck. And I went, that's what I do for a living. <laughs> so, so you, you can, you know, it was a nice way to make that clear. By the way, they're all nice now, college graduated donors. Um, this was a while back. Um, you um, get to the stuff that really makes, you know, you, get you excited. You really are a national voice for the incredible potential of impact investing, and not just as a sort of side track of something the foundation does,
but of a holistic way of thinking about your giving. Tell us a little bit about how you got to that point and where the foundation has come now. I'm so glad you asked. This is um, one of my favorite things to talk about. And actually, um, what you just shared about your nieces and nephews, my son, too, didn't really get what I got uh, or what I did for a living until I took him to hear me speak at SMU. I lecture in um, some college courses. And he got to hear me speak. And then afterwards, we talked about what impact investing means. I know. And he was able to spit it back out to me in, you know, layman's terms. How old is he? He's five. But, you know, they start to pick up on these things. Yeah. Um, but he does need to know what impact investing is because that's why mommy's in Atlanta tonight to get to right. talk about this and um, other things I do. Are really now it's evolved into... Um, and this is what my platform is mostly focused on. So through our philanthropic journey, I mentioned some of our grant making. Um, we were some other examples of the grant making, which will segue into the um, broader approach we now take. Um, we were the first five million in on a new performing arts center that had been trying to happen in downtown Greensboro for 15 years, but there just wasn't the private capital uh, pledged to get that project, some wind in its sails. So, um, we funded that and then leveraged our gift to, through the Community Foundation's help, um, and they managed the campaign to raise $45 million in private capital, and then the city put in the rest, about a $70 million project um, that just had its groundbreaking. Um, and then we put in the first $5 million as well for um, a scholarship endowment to ensure that every child who graduates from Guilford County Schools has college tuition guaranteed. Um, Guilford County has 72,000 children in it, Guilford County Schools does, which is actually larger than Atlanta's school system for some context, because Greensboro and High Point share a county, so um, it's a broad area. So we raised 40-something um, million for that as well. We call ourselves a catalytic capital platform because we like to add unique value, and in those two campaigns, it was being the first in, being the bold ones with the big dollars, and being young, young enough and naive enough to do that. Um, but we were able to catalyze a lot of um, capital towards these once in a generation projects that are now happening. Um, but we felt like, okay, that's all fine and good. We're seeing really quick wins with our grant making. Um, and it's all really impactful. We feel like we're stewarding the foundation well. But we couldn't sleep at night because I'm not a finance person. I, my background's in fashion. Um, but we would sit through these investment committee meetings um, that we, you know, we had a financial services firm that would come and present our portfolio every quarter at the foundation meeting. And it was so over my head in the beginning and so uninteresting to me. Um, and then it clicked that, okay, I'm focused completely on the 5% we give away. Why? That mathematically doesn't make sense. Shouldn't I be focused on 100% of what we're stewarding? And so I started getting smart about the other 95%. And how can we leverage that for impact as well? And of course, not compromise financial returns, because the only way we're sustainable and impactful in the long run and on to the next generation is if we can maintain our 5% payout and then some, right? So we need to make strong financial returns. But I also can't sleep at night if with our 5% we're ending homelessness in Guilford County and somewhere in this vague 95% portfolio we may be investing millions of dollars in a company that hypothetically uses uh, sweatshop labor. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just throwing that out. So we started this conversation um, as a family and with our financial advisors who were like, oh, cute little millennial asking questions about values and money, like <laughs> how cliche. <laughs> Um, so we fired them. <laughs> good move, good move. Um, well, and then we went through a national RFP process to find the right advisors who had a track record in this space and had clients much larger than, than our assets um, who knew how to guide us through this journey. We went from 7% values aligned in our uh, investment portfolio to 74% values aligned in three quarters. Then, now, today, we're at 96% values alignment across our full portfolio. I now know what basis points are, what an <laughs> asset class is. I know the ter what the term fixed income means. There you go. And all that stuff. So I was reading a book, actually, I would recommend to all of you. Um, it's 600 pages, and it's called The New Frontiers of Philanthropy. And I was reading this book, and my husband was like, 
what is that? He thought I was like reading the Bible every night. And I was like, no, this is a book that's catching me up to speed on these terms that have just been going over my head in these investment committee meetings. And I feel like I'm incompetent as a foundation director if I don't understand where the majority of our money is going and sitting. And um, I'd be like, what's a bond? And in the middle of dinner. And um, so anyways, got smart enough to start asking the right questions and thinking strategically about leveraging our full portfolio for impact. And it started with first, let's do no harm. Let's screen out what we can as best we can. Um, and through the right partnership with the right financial advisors, we were able to implement some tools to achieve that. We were also able to have a discussion as a family about our collective values, and we're all very different. Kevin's uncle is very um, passionate about LGBT issues as a gay man himself. Kevin's sister is really passionate about animals and education. Her degree is in photography from SCAD um, here in Georgia. She lives out in LA now. Um, Kevin and I are fortunately, you know, we're married and happen to be aligned in our values, so that's kind of a two-in-one. There's not a fight between the president of the board, my, <laughs> happens to be my husband, and the executive director. That could be uh, messy. <laughs> interesting pillow talk, yeah. But um, we were able to come together as a family and have a values alignment discussion because I framed it in this way. I said, here are some screening options. This was step one, you know, first do no harm. How do we get there? Okay, and then there's all these categories that can be screened. And, you know, the Baptists and the Catholics have started this conversation back in the 60s and 70s with their portfolios and the ESG movement and all of that, SRI too. Um, but we went through category by category and just asked this question, do we as a family foundation want to profit from XYZ? Do we as a family foundation want to profit from tobacco? Do we as a family foundation, want, with our mission being what it is, want to profit from adult entertainment? And it made the answer pretty clear in most categories. Then were there, when there were areas where one trustee in particular felt strongly, like I would have zero tolerance for that, we respected that. And it was like two or three things out of 12 that we were you know, looking at. So we just said, okay, fine. I mean, that's mm -hmm. going to be 8% of our portfolio screened around that, and we're not um, you know, it's not going to hurt us financially to respect that trustee's right. opinion on that issue. Abortion was one that was contentious, you know, on the board. So we decided, you know, we're just not going to go there, neutralize mm -hmm. the conversation. Um, and we, as with our grant making portfolio, apply an issue agnostic approach to our proactive direct impact investments too. We're more opportunistic there than issue area specific. Um, so we do have a bucket of our portfolio that is allocated towards direct investments for impact. I went rogue on this one, and since I knew the Ecola, to bring it back to the beginning of the conversation, I knew the Ecola project very well, having um, been on the ground with it, I'd been on the board for six years, and I was in a board meeting for Ecola, and they are a nonprofit. Um, so it's not always that you would do an impact investment in a nonprofit, but we, um, I brought it to the trustees and I said, they just asked me for a $500,000 grant to fulfill a purchase order from a national department store. Um, and I told them to get back to us with an impact investment proposal. And the board was kind of like, what does that even mean? And mm -hmm. um, I told Ecola, what it sounds like you need really is a bridge loan, not a grant. You have... Um, this revenue securitized by a purchase order form, you just need the capital to buy the materials and hire the women to fulfill it, so then can't you pay it back? And then I can propose it to my board as an investment instead of a grant, because our grants are Guilford County focused. So this took us global, it allowed us to have, you know, dip our toe in the water, it was $500,000, which out of a $60 million platform was not, you know, going to break the bank, and um, the trustees trusted me on it, and we ended up making a 5% return in one year. It was a success, um, and it actually outperformed the returns on our fully diversified portfolio with those uh, guys that we'd fired eventually. Um, Look but what the happens trust when you teach you what the word bond means, <laughs> and where you went from there. So anyway, we, that, through that pilot, um, the trustees started saying, okay, we want more of that, because not only did we present a market right financial return in the scheme of how our portfolio was constructed and allocated at that time, but I was also able to show them an impact report. So we were able to double the amount of women that the project employs. Um, we were able to scale their sales numbers. And we were um, also able to, through our um, loan being paid back on time and at rate, give them credit enhancement to secure traditional bank loans in the future as their business scaled. 
So that's something a grant can't accomplish, right? It, we could have probably, Kevin and I, written a $500,000 check to it and felt great. Now they're in um, that department store and we helped do that. But now they're in all 42 Neiman Marcus stores and have hired 500 women. You know, and that scale, type of scaling, even for a nonprofit, would not have happened if we hadn't taken more of a business approach and opened up our corpus to impact as well. One of the things that Elizabeth's story brings up for me is the fact that, and you probably don't expect to hear about this at a philanthropy forum, but philanthropy involves money. And I meet an awful lot of not necessarily so young adults who've never had to pay a bill or write a check, never had to have a budget. Um, and at a, sort of at a minimum, never really understood basic finances, not just of the foundation, but of the family. And the families often feel awkward about talking about it. And this is one of the places where I'll often advise a family to engage your advisors, because they're happy to give them an overview of the financial wherewithal, the community foundation, you know, I'm sure could be part of this in terms of if the, the money is here, what, you know, how, how does it work? How do, you know, how is it invested? How is it spent? Um, but it gives the financial literacy that they may not be arranging microloans and, and, and that Elizabeth is doing, but they'll understand. If they have to look at the financial statement of a nonprofit, they're thinking of funding. They sort of know if that nonprofits in good health. So never eliminate the notion of getting them involved. Um, <clears throat> similarly, I've met families who feel awkward talking to their adult children about the family circumstances. And sometimes, they're, though they're perfectly comfortable with the family's financial or legal advisor filling that in. So it's a really, really good point that, that you make about you had that learning curve. Oh, definitely. And you, which you probably never would have had if you kept those financial advisors. <laughs> what, um, before we get into some questions, um, it's sort of hard to take all the different aspects of this that you've been exploring, but what have you taken away from the few years that you've been involved in this that could be inspiring, challenging, encouraging to those who are here? That's today. a tall order. <laughs> it is a tall order. Um, You've had a very tall five years. Yeah. It's been a whirlwind, but we're all on a journey. And um, I think the most important thing to remember is that to much whom is given, much is required. And that's the mantra we live by. Just do the best with what you can and don't turn a blind eye to certain areas of your platform that may be able to really make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, another area I didn't mention, my husband and I, um, We'll actually be in Portugal later this week presenting on this. Um, he turned around the operating business, the third generation operating business towards impact as well by leading his team through a um, uh, mission, vision, values exercise, um, applying an environmental lens to real estate and has become really a leader on responsible gentrification as well um, through some experiences that we were blindsided by. That's a whole nother story. But I, all that to say, um, my encouragement is to not bifurcate your family circumstances. Like I think the traditional family office approach is make your money over here and give it away over here. We just can't see it that way as millennials generally. I'm not the voice of a generation, I should speak for myself. I can't see it that way, my husband can't see it that way, a lot of our peers don't see it that way. Rather, we only understand how can we do well as we do good. That's why you see the rise of social entrepreneurship as the new normal. That's why you see all this confusion about the millennial mindset. Mm -hmm. um, but there's just not that bifurcation in our brains and our hearts between um, doing well and doing good. So that's what I'll leave you with is just maybe think about, as we've had to, um, what parts of your platform are you not thinking about? Um, and that's really, and where are you not engaging your next generation in those conversations too? Because it's so important. One thing Kevin did get from his grandfather is he understood where he was coming from. He was a different generation. We wouldn't agree with everything he did um, now, but when you put it in context, um, at least you know his mindset. So Kevin has still taken a very conservative approach to um, family investments and the real estate company, all that he got from his grandfather. And his grandfather actually left him with a volume, can never be published publicly because it's so politically incorrect and like 
in some ways disturbing, but also there are so many good nuggets of information that are just gold, even more helpful than the trust documents or anything we've heard orally from employees. He wrote a little book called Inside Information uh, by Kermit Phillips, and he gave it just to family members. It's leather-bound, self-published, um, and it's all of his thoughts on everything from investing, how and why he went into real estate, the best way he saw fit for um, the model of the real estate company, diversification. He even recommended having dual citizenship in Ireland just in case America goes to hell. <laughs> I mean, you just have to laugh. Um, but let me look at the watch. <laughs> give you a status report. But that's, um, uh, that was a really great gift to mm -hmm. us. Yeah. We didn't get time with him as adults, but we um, at least have that, and my children will have that, right. and I'll encourage um, my parents to leave that to our children mm -hmm. too. So that's another thing to think about in your spare time. Just write a little book about everything you think about. <laughs> of all the things we've given you, don't forget the storytelling. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is the way these things are passed down. Um, children do see what you do not you know, solely what you, what you say. And, and it, I've heard so many remarkable stories of people who were inspired at a very young age by family members, even before there was any wealth in the family. Mm -hmm. They're just incredibly empowering and wonderful for a young person to feel a part of that. Um, as we think about question and answers, I'm sitting here aware that Elizabeth can help give personal experience and answer questions you might have about that. Um, I've been lucky in a whole lot of years to interview about 2,500 philanthropic families, so you get to ask anything from, from me. But we're um, short of your junior high experience. We don't have a lot of Atlanta expertise up here, so we were hoping Alicia would come and sit with us and let you all ask us some questions so we can have now the conversation with all of you. But if you heard anything you want to hear more about or something, question, you know, you had a question or whatever, please do. You're just going to drag us over, over a chair here? Yeah, I'm just dragging up a chair come like, be our like it's a come be family our, table, come be, you know? our, come be our centerpiece. Yes, this, yes. this is not the Thank children's so table. <laughs> this is not awesome. the children's really table. Awesome. No, I'm there just adding local color if it That's it. is needed. That's it. <laughs> um, anyway, question. Somebody has to be the brave first person. Go what? easy on us, though with that big light that's coming in front of us, we may not see. Okay. You, you mentioned uh, not, not invading, but using the corpus of your fund to, to give loans. Was there any restriction or any, any issues around that as far as the way the trusts were set up to be able to use that money? Yeah, that's a good question and something we've had legal look into a lot because one thing I didn't get to is now that we've pinpointed those once in a generation grants, that portfolio of a dozen game changer opportunities in Guilford. We're now shifting the foundation towards exclusively implementing um, loans with the 5% through the PRI tool, program related investment tool, which the IRS actually approved back in 1968 or 69, but only 200 foundations have accessed and used. Mm -hmm. So we see it as a way to recycle our grant making capital and to build our 5% without growing our corpus. So I give that context to answer your question because there are um, legal requirements to implement low interest loans and we do low interest loans with our 5% but then anything that touches the corpus ha does have to meet that fiduciary mark. Um, and so with the example of the Ecola investment I gave, it really replaced a bond allocation, which was going to return, you know, 2.53 per, you know, so not a high return anyway. So that portion of our portfolio, um, it was market rate enough for that, past the fiduciary sniff test. So the corpus is all market rate investments. With the 5%, we do those types of low interest loans. Um, and the only thing that came up in our trust documents is that, um, and we really had to get a microscope out and just make sure we were okay to shift the focus in this direction, but um, we, with the 5%, cannot hold um, equity portions in anything, and um, so we do lean more towards allocating our fixed income space in the portfolio towards those opportunities. But we're digging into that more to see how much flexibility we can push on it, because there, there are opportunities across asset classes, both on the corpus side and the 5% side, in regards to impact investing. Um, Alicia, could you say a word about differences between the public 
charity option and the yeah, private foundation option? Yeah. It's, as a community foundation, we're a public charity, which is different than a private foundation. And it's, we're about to, in the beginning of 2018, launch impact investing through the community foundation. And so we're very excited about that and that opportunity. That is so progressive, y'all. <laughs> you don't understand. That is a big deal. It is a big deal. And I'm it's so gonna excited. it's gonna be really interesting. And it's we're starting out with loans, very low interest, long term loans to really be able to, you know, as you're saying, scale, move the mark, really make a bigger difference than you can just make with grants. Um, and looking at that, and Mark Crosswell's here tonight, and Mark is our Director of Social Impact for the Community Foundation and is working on putting all these pieces together. Initially, we will be using some of our assets that are unrestricted assets, and then over, once we get our sea legs, we'll be inviting donors who have funds in the foundation to be able to join us in being able to make these impact investments across health, um, community development, arts, education, and nonprofit effectiveness, because it's, it's time. It's time. I mean, it's ahead just of your, time. It is time, but you're also ahead of your time. Yeah, Our donor time. advice fund sits at the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, because we scanned the country for where could we have a donor advice fund that also offered impact investing opportunities while our cash is sitting there to go out in grants, and they were at the time the And best you had platform. to go to the other end of the country. So we had to, to go to, one. yeah. Yeah, so well, we will Atlanta, be the only one in the southeast. Yeah, it's awesome. It's so exciting. Yeah, I'm not sure that that the, there are a lot more. It's more than just the southeast. Right. Um, yes. Other questions. I think I sort of heard the answer on this, but you could have made a grant to your community foundation to, to make that impact grant for rather than using the, your private foundation. It would have been a little bit more straightforward in terms of not having the all the issues with the taxes and the uh, having to go through the legal ramifications. The pilot right? impact investment, the yeah. one to Uganda? Yeah. No, um, the Community Foundation would not implement a low interest loan from our corpus. That is something we address with our financial advisors. They wouldn't do it because it's off platform. So we just did it you know, in our direct investment um, pool in house. But Alicia, you, you would do that here, right? Yeah, we do do some of that. Yeah, which is also yeah, uh, it's, really it, think, right. thing. It's a matter of the policies. It's a, and of the it's a matter of size to. and scale of the community foundation too. Right. I mean, you know, Greensboro is smaller than Atlanta. I mean, the community foundation is smaller, and it's one of the advantages of being a larger community foundation and having the staff and having the capabilities, mm -hmm. having the back office, and being able to really take that next leap forward. And that's what we've been investing in ourselves. Yeah in this past couple of years is investing in the capacity to be able to offer these kinds of things. Because this is what millennial donors want. It is what the next generation, and it will um, move the issues further faster. Someone's was over here. Anyone else? I have a question. I can probably You do, yes. Go right for it. Thank you all, this was so fascinating. And thank you, Elizabeth, for coming in from Texas. We are parents of young children, so I'm very excited about your Give As You Grow platform. I can't wait to see that launched. And this is just a um, question about details. I'm just curious why the responsibility fell on you and your husband when his grandfather died. You mentioned his father and uncle. Was there, I'm just curious why, why that was shifted to you all with no background in the business and the foundation. Yeah, they were neither interested nor capable, the second generation. So we were up to bat. And your grandfather liked you both. Yeah, that's that true makes too. a difference. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, sir. <laughs> you have a private foundation <clears throat> serving like a community foundation. Is is there? Does this led others to get more involved? Is there a, a real uh, independent community foundation that's come up in the area, or, or is that what you're doing as well? So we partnered with the Community Foundation of Greater Greensboro, which had been in existence for a while. So for example, the Performing Arts Center campaign I mentioned, they had been trying to raise the private capital goal for that. For a decade, they'd had a task force on it 
what we were able to provide was that catalytic capital to launch the campaign into reality. So by coming out with a statement that we're going to be first in and we're giving at a seven-figure level to this project because it's that important to revitalize our downtown and to anchor the arts community as well as the center city, um, that, that's something that um, a statement we can make. And then we also launched something I didn't mention um, called Generation G Pack. So this was a movement that my husband and I created to change the conversation, and it was housed at the Community Foundation. So um, we wanted the conversation about the new Performing Arts Center to stop being so political and less about white rich people going to the symphony and more about the fact that this will revitalize our downtown, restaurants will pop up, it'll increase the tax base, yada, yada, yada. We'll be able to take our children to the Lion King. The local schools will be able to use the facility. Um, so we mobilized as many people under the age of 50 as we could in the conversation to change the face of the project and sent um, 20s and 30-somethings to city council meetings to speak in support of the effort. Um, we mobilized 600 people under the age of 50 in six months for that. That's only possible. I was a one-woman show. I hired my first staff member at the Phillips Foundation two years ago. I was like three years into this journey. Um, and so the Community Foundation housed the staff that would then reach out to someone if we needed a home to host the event in or um, have a pig picking or something through another organization to engage people around the conversation, that type of stuff. So the Community Foundation we, was our partner and um, we, were, we never intended to replace what they did. We really wanted to um, help them achieve some of the projects that they'd already laid the groundwork for and had donor interest in. We were just able to pop in with um, you know, the numbers necessary to create that energy and a next gen face to some issues. And I will say, as I said, impact was the number two concern on your minds that we learned in our, the study that we did with the Urban Institute. Impact investing now is probably the most talked about topic in, in the organized field of philanthropy. So when you go to meetings and gatherings, they're talking about it. There are some terrific resources out there um, and to, some terrific groups that care about this. But the on-the-ground work is being done by partnerships with people who, who are coming together and mobilizing and catalyzing. But to talk about program-related investments, I've seen whole groups revitalize downtowns. Mm -hmm. Kansas City was a big part of this work. Um, there's um, social, most people know about socially responsible investing. That's when you do use the kinds of screens that you talked about. And one of the things I love that you said is, people are learning they don't have to sacrifice return. Exactly. For screens. We, our returns have improved since we've become nearly 100% values aligned. The reason we're 96% values aligned and not 100% values aligned is because our old advisors put us in some private equity stuff we can't get out of till uh, a few more years. But our returns have improved. My husband and I are also co-founders of something called The Impact, which is um, a group of families who are um, seeking to become conscious, conscious of their the impact of their investments. Um, and through that platform as well, we're able to share learnings. And several of our co-founders of that effort are in the book you'll be receiving tonight. They were interviewed for that. Mm -hmm. um, but the impact also offers a data platform where we can share a portfolio performance. So I can say through seeing the data that's inputted by, across the impact network that as a group, we're, our financial performance is very solid, and we're not sacrificing um, impact right. to achieve those financial returns. The, the other thing that's been coming up in the field as a result of some of these conversations is that the issue about perpetuity or multiple generations in a donor advice fund or a limited life, these are all now being considered as a part of this. So are we... You talked about that dilemma at first of being, is it 5%, but then you realized what you could do with the 95. That's for those of you with the private foundations. Mm -hmm. And many private foundations are saying they're not sure that they want this to be forever and yeah. ever and ever. Um, it's an important conversation. It's a very, it's a very important, important conversation. conversation for families to have. It's, and one of the most dramatic testaments to that conversation is when I first looked into that statistic, and this was in the early 90s, 87% said they expect it to exist in perpetuity. At this point, 40% are undecided. Mm -hmm. 
They just don't know. And for others, it means a different vehicle. It means, are there other vehicles that better support this? Yeah. Was I right to be steered to this? Yeah. You know? And is it forever? As, as, a, as a lovely 87-year-old woman in Memphis told me one time, but Ginny, perpetuity is such a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's interesting, though, how impact investing and the emergence of that conversation is changing the dynamic. The dynamic, it because, is. Because um, there's a philanthropist in Dallas, for example, example, Lida Hill, who's a member of the Giving Pledge, um, and she is spending down all of her, she pledged to spend down all of her wealth within her lifetime. She has no heirs. She's very impact-oriented. Mm -hmm. Now that she understands impact investing, yes. she's not regretting you know, her pledge, and I think she'll move forward with giving away all of her wealth within her lifetime. But she's like, now that I get impact investing, I, this is, I want to get rich again. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I can do it all again. Do it all over well, again. Well, giving pledges are only required to give away half. Yeah, she's one of the extreme. Oh, she went extreme. 100%. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is there one more question before we, did you have your, you had, right there, Right. Please. I'll speak that. Okay. Um, I kind of want to go to the nonprofit side. So, Community Foundation, you all keep the tabs on um, back to the millennial conversation, a lot of nonprofits, some of which I sit on, are changing their platform to focus on millennial giving in a big way. A lot of dollars are going towards this. What is your advice towards investors or grant givers who are seeing these changes? What do you think? Do you think? Want to take it? You, do you go, give, give it a chance. Give no, it's chance. interesting. So going back to, okay, yeah. well, going back to the Ecola example, um, we had to remodel that nonprofit to be eligible for our impact capital. Um, also something we've done in Guilford County with nonprofits, we just gathered 70 nonprofits um, this summer to talk about the changing dynamics in philanthropy. There's not enough grant dollars to support all the nonprofits in Guilford County. There's almost as many nonprofits in Guilford County as there are in New York City. Um, it's crazy. So what we and there's an initiative in Dallas going on called Better Together, which is encouraging nonprofits to merge and create economies of scale and share um, back office. And um, if their missions are aligned, how can they mm -hmm. better cooperate towards the same goals on a certain issue? Um, but what we're facilitating as a foundation, and I'm curious if you have any other input on this, but we are getting nonprofits in a room so that they understand when they come to us for a grant why we say we're not accepting grant applications, please get back to us with an impact investment proposal. They don't know what an impact investment proposal would look like, especially in Guilford County. Mm -hmm. So we do workshops with nonprofits um, and partner again with the Community Foundation in Greensboro to do this. Um, if anyone has nonprofit partners, it's a community foundation to know who to get in the room. And then we walk them through how they could be eligible through creating an earned revenue stream for their nonprofit or um, otherwise to then tap into this new bucket of impact investing that millennials especially are increasingly involved in and interested in. Now, we're at the very early stages, and that's the difficult thing is the pipeline. Exactly. Where is it that you can invest and who's ready for that investment? And, I, I think it's going to be, yes, exactly. I mean, I think it's initially it's less about having the money to invest as it is, to, as Mark will say, the investments ready to, you know, ready there. And that, so that just, that's going to take time. It's a, it's a mindset change. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different way of thinking about things. As a nonprofit who my, schiz, my particular schizophrenia is that I have to know enough about how the grant making process works to run a successful grant seeking operations, so there, there's a little bit of that. I would caution nonprofits to make sure they're understanding their community yeah. of millennials. Um, what I said to you before, people are leaping and using the phrase, and they could be talking about very different groups of people. Um, the Millennial Impact Project did a study of millennials and how they come to volunteer and how they come to make grants and things like that, that I would commend to anybody looking, they say things like they like being involved, you know, they're worried about their time, but between 45 and 55 percent said no one's ever asked them to volunteer, be on a committee, much less a board. So I'd say 
One of my favorite quotes out of the Millennial Impact Project is from the person who said, stop trying to figure out millennials, just engage us, get us involved. <laughs> you know. So I would say before you redirect every bit of your development or service component or whatever, make sure you understand why and what you want to get out of it so you go after the right things. Thank you, too. You're Thank right you too. so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. To me, it's very, very special to have them here, and I, I thank you so much. I mean, you really brought us new ideas, but you reinforced things, and I think everybody is going to leave with some nuggets around what they can think about as they begin to be part of that generational transfer. Atlanta's about to go through, just like the rest of the country, the greatest generational transfer of wealth. And so we need to be thinking about it in a very careful way so that people can be prepared for the role that they will be playing in the future. We're all giving you a book as you leave, um, which has been mentioned. It's called Generation Impact, How Next-Gen Donors Are Revolutionizing Giving. I think you will find it extremely helpful. It was published yesterday, so it is truly hot off the press. Um, yesterday was its publication date, but because we knew one of the authors, we were able to get sort of copies early. Um, so please enjoy it. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is when you were talking about the young people, um, the Community Foundation this year put together an amazing, I mean, this staff at the Community Foundation is awesome. And between the marketing staff and the philanthropic officers, they put together a book for, young, uh, for parents to use with young children around giving, and it's called Philanthropy ATL, Engaging the Next Generation in Giving. So if you have young children and you haven't gotten a copy of this yet, please ask your philanthropic officer, either Barrett, Aaron, Kathleen, or Stacy, um, and they will be happy to work with you to get a copy, because this is a really good tool at engaging that next generation, engaging the little ones. So thank you very much for being here tonight. And as I mentioned, you're going to be hearing more from us about lots of different things, like the impact investing um, that will be coming out in 2018. We're so appreciative of you being part of the Community Foundation, you using your fund, you're adding to your fund. It's an active part of your life and of your family's life. And please know that we're always here ready to be able to be your partner and your GPS to make your philanthropy effective and efficient. Get your book, drive safely, and thank you so much for being here.